worldly system as if being a preacher or a pastor or evangelist or prophet is not good enough. Like God can't be God if we don't do that. Well, ain't nothing wrong with doing that. Well, I don't see Tiger Woods playing golf and preaching on the side. So why is it so hard for us to focus clearly and solely on the things that God has called and created us to do and then we got to have a, a plan B? That's, some, that's always been nonsense to me. Because I'm the type of person, I'm either all in or I'm all out. If I can't be sold out for what I'm doing, I'm not going to waste my time doing it. That's why there's only going to be a remnant. That's gonna, the Bible talks about the remnant. The Bible often uses the metaphor of fruit to describe the produce of our life. Fruit can either be good or bad. King James Version has 289 instances of the word fruit being used. If you don't understand nothing else in the Bible, you need to know if you're producing good fruit or bad fruit based on the things you're doing and saying. Fruit is a direct result of whatever controls the heart. God the Father is the gardener, according to John 15, 1-5. We're talking about first fruit fast as we prepare for it. Got about 16 days left in our ministry. And the people who was partaking, I had somebody hit me up yesterday asked me about the first fruit fast. And some people just don't understand these godly principles because people don't teach them. That's the only reason. The world don't know Jesus because we don't teach about Jesus or teach about having a relationship with Jesus. Teaching stuff based off the problem. John 15, 1 through 5, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. It's important for you to understand something. People be like, why me? Why me? It's because you're bearing fruit. He, say, he says those who, who bear fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. We think when we're being purged that we're being punished. I mean, I, I'm the same way sometimes. There are times when I go through stuff and I'm like, man, here I am doing all this good work and I'm getting dealt with. I'm having issues. Well, that just means he's going to bring forth more fruit from the things that I'm going through. Read that again. Every branch that, every branch in me, like I, and that's a very good uh statement to understand every branch in me because there's different other branches different other trees every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that's why he's trying to explain to people when you when you're doing everything you know to do right and, and you're getting attacked don't trip don't bug out don't lose it keep the faith you living right you're paying tithes you, you know when 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 stuff started to go fall apart in my life or stuff is not going the way I think it should go, I start examining myself and looking at different areas. I'm like, well, I'm doing everything I know to do right, so I'm just going to count it all joy and stand. He says, for every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So he wants more fruit from the people that's bearing fruit. Verse 3, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. <laughs> except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, and, excuse me, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. He's talking about bearing fruit. Without him, you can do nothing. If anybody know anything about planting or trees or fruit, as soon as you pick something, it starts dying. As soon as you tear something away from the source in which it was used to bring it forth, it starts dying. As soon as we was cut from the umbilical cord, we start dying. The clock starts ticking. As a baby, I know, I, like I said, seven biological children. As soon as we cut that cord and they're separated from what used to feed them and everything that went on inside of there, as soon as that's cut, now, they, now they're now they on their own. And that's what Jesus is saying. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You don't ever want to be separated. And one thing that First Fruits Fast does for us who do it is it aligns us with him first. Before all the problems of the year is going to bring come forth. I remember in 2020 when we did our first fruits fast. And this was before the virus was really publicized and came out. And everybody was going crazy about it. At the end of the fast. 
in February when my daughter and granddaughter came to visit me here in Florida, the Lord allowed me to get the virus. And I, there, no one knew what it was or what was going on. And I'm not a sickly type of person. I can't remember the last time I've been sick. Last time I've been to the hospital was 1969 when I was born. So I'm sitting here like, what in the world is going on? What is this that's on me? And I, I can sense things in the spirit. Not that I'm super spirit or super Christian. I can sense when something is trying to, to penetrate my body. And I was like, what is going on? And I, I prayed and asked God. God said, call this man of God. And I called one person when that, 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 that foul spirit was had got access to my body and I called the man of God I said you know man I'm, I'm underneath the weather and my daughter's here my granddaughter's here in Florida visiting with me I need you to pray for me the Lord told me to call you and have you pray for me and so he prayed and the Lord revealed to me that what I was dealing with number one wasn't unto death that's what you want to know when if you ever get plagued by any form of sickness or disease you want to get an understanding that's all I wanted you know because I want to be able to give God glory like I said, I'm not trying to pretend like I'm super Christian, but this is the life that I've chosen to live in the way I've chosen to live it, by faith. So I asked God, I said, what would you have me do? And he, he's like, it wasn't under death, it was for a testimony. And I didn't even know what it was. And so as, I, as it, it, it progressed, and I was weak, and I was going through all the different symptoms that, that they would eventually reveal to people that when you have this nonsense is, um, my daughter was putting a rag on my head, and then she ended up getting you know, weakened, and my granddaughter was kind of sluggish around. And, you know, I still went to the beach and, you know, stuff, but I was so, so weak. And then as it came out, I found out that's what I had. And the Lord said it was for a testimony. So you can tell people what it is and, and how it was. And it was directly after my first fruits fast that I experienced this thing. So it was amazing how God had gave me strength to get through the fast and then allowed that to happen for me to have it as a testimony to help people understand that greater is he that's in us than we that's in this world. So no matter what you go through, no matter what you experience, I don't care what it is. I don't care who, who lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I don't care what kind of diseases or plagues they come up with. The vac All this stuff don't matter if God is greater. So it's important that that's the type of fruit that we produce with the choices we make with the life that he's given us. Because the life belongs to God, the choice belongs to us. And when you make Jesus the first, he will be first. And you can commune with him as the first. So God the Father is the gardener. God desires us to be fruitful. The Bible makes it very clear that, and we just read that when we, in John 15, verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You know, I tell people all the time, my children are not my children. I was used to bring forth them children. I'm a steward. You know what I'm saying? When people call me and like, can you pray for me, my child, my child? I say, well, give that child, give it to the Lord. Give the situation, give the circumstances. Because I don't know very many people who did Planned Parenthood. If you like me, somebody came and told you, hey, uh, I missed my thing last month. And, you know, that, that, that's how I got the news I was about to be a, a, a father. I didn't sit down and say, hey, well, we're going to have a boy or we're going to have a girl or blah, blah, blah. That ain't how I went down. <laughs> somebody told me they was pregnant and I had to mentally and physically prepare for what was about to come forth nine months later. So it says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. And like I shared before, if you've ever done any kind of gardening or any kind of thing, as soon as you pick something or take something from the source, it starts dying. And that's how we are as believers. When we disconnect ourselves from the revelation and the power of Almighty God, and Jesus Christ, by way of the Holy Spirit, when we start coming up for our own interpretations of stuff, when we start doing things by, by way of the tradition of men, you are literally cutting yourself off from the, the Jesus Christ, who he was, is, and is to come. And I was raised in some, in, in some powerful teachings and powerful ministries. And unfortunately, a lot of them were so, so engrafted into the traditions of men that, that uh, it, it wasn't effective. Because you can't mix the word of God with anything in its pureness. You can't. You can't water down what Jesus said. There are times where people um, say, well, you should dumb it down so everybody can understand it. No, we bring people up. We don't, we, don't, we don't push them or keep them down. You need to study to show your self-approval, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing. Where does this part go? Where does that part go? What do I need to do to grasp a full understanding of what the Spirit is saying to the church? 
Abide in me and I in you. I told you we have a covenant relationship with Almighty God, but you have to abide in him. What's that mean? That means when you wake up, thank you, Jesus, for waking me up. Say your prayer, the steps of a good man in order by the Lord. Read you some word. Speak those things. It's not. This is going to be a prosperous day. I am more than a conqueror. Uh, you know, greater is he that sent me to meet us in the world. You start speaking those things before you set foot out of the door. You start putting things in motion. You start saying, hey, this is going to be a blessed day. This is going to be the best day. You start saying things, affirmations, proclaiming things, speaking those. The power of life and death is in your tongue. You start speaking those things, and it, it turns into a lifestyle, and before you know it, you're living fully for the Lord. So we, the Bible lets us know that fruit is important. You're either good fruit, or you're either bad fruit. I'm going to go turn to Matthew 7, 16 through 20. So it's not bearing good fruit. Give one more example on fruit, and then we'll move on to the fast portion. So it's called the first fruit fast that we're about to partake on, where we'll be off the internet for an entire month in our ministry, and we will not be doing anything but like the mountainside experience is what I like, I like to call it. Matthew 7, 16, reason this wise. You shall know them by their fruits. It says, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or thistles? Verse 17, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. <clears throat> a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. You remember the old saying we said back in the day that uh, a, a, a rotten apple spoils all the apples? You never heard of a group of people fixing a bad apple. Don't work that way. But uh, it talks about how a rotten apple can, you put a rotten apple in with all the good apples, next thing you know the other apples are rotten. That, that's, that's true. That's true. I'm willing to, to do whatever it is God has called and created me to do to help win a soul. But once a person lets you know beyond a shadow of any and every doubt, they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ and the way, the truth, and the life, that all you can do is pray. I was just talking to somebody uh, the other day, and, and I said, look, in this situation, in these circumstances, you're put in a position where all you can do and pray, and that's probably the best thing that you can do. Because we can't save anybody. All we can do is lead them. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So not only are you supposed to produce good fruit, if you don't produce fruit, good fruit. See, this is the part... Uh, of the Bible that I don't know why some people are scared to preach about what's going to happen if you don't do what God has called and created us to do. And we all know what the, the, the fear of the Lord is, the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. So when you honestly, honestly fear God, I remember my, my initial coming back to the Lord in my early 20s was because I didn't want to go to hell. I hadn't developed a love for Jesus Christ. I hadn't developed a love for the, the church, the physical church, or the people yet. But what I did have was a fear of knowing that if I do not accept him as my Savior and Lord, that I'm going to burn in an eternal lake of fire. I feared that, and I still do to this day. I know that's a reality that I will face if I don't do what God has called and created me to do. He allowed me to be birthed into creation for his purpose, not mine. When I hear people say this, that, and the other, I'm like, Lord, he's a Lord or he's not. He can't, he's not a part-time Lord. You can't say, well, he's Lord on, on, on my Sabbath or my Sunday, but he's not Lord Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's, it doesn't work that way. He's either Lord or he's not. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Flat out. You know, ifs, ands, or but. You were called to produce fruit. And what better way to align what God has called and created you to do than to do the first fruits fast and gasp, grasp an understanding of what God desires for you to do for the year that he has given you, this new calendar year that he has given you. How could you know, how could you get instructions or information if you never take time to get it? Finally, verse 20, he says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. When, when God first revealed to me, probably maybe 1998, about Leviticus 23, I like to call it the Old Testament Gospel. Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. 
And I never knew prior to that how they had anything to do with Jesus. So when it was revealed to me the importance of us observing the feast, we can't keep the feast because we don't, we don't sacrifice animals and do all those type of things anymore, but we observe it. We observe it and grasp a full understanding of its purpose and its reason, and we teach it to our children, supposedly. Because the Bible in Matthew 28, 20 says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the world. When we operate in, in the things that God has called and created us to do, then we will produce the fruit that God said we can have. I believe the biggest issue with the body of Jesus Christ in the church in this present time is that we don't do what God has called and created us to do. Traditions of men have literally taken over everything and been replaced the things that God has called and told us to do. We're not bearing the fruit that God has told us that we're supposed to do by the things that, by the principles that we're supposed to be operating in. So as a result, we have what we have in the world. Yes, I'm saying that the church is the reason the world is the way it is. Because God has cre called and created us to be salt of the earth. And if when salt loses its saltiness, we're not going to be a preserver. And we can't do the things that God has called and created us to do. It's, it's, this stuff is not a mystery. In any way, shape, or form. It's not. So understanding fruit is important. We talked about being first. We talked about the fruit. And the last one is fasting. The first fruit is fast. <clears throat> now, fasting is a word that will get you blessed out in church sometimes. You talk about people missing meals and pushing away stuff and turning off stuff and not doing stuff. Now, now this is what a rubber meets the road because you're dealing with the discipline of an individual. And a lot of people... I've come to find out are not very disciplined folks. They will try to use grace as a license to sin, as if God will accept whatever they give them, and it's not even their best. I, I don't know where that mentality came from. I have no idea where people just think they can offer God anything, and he has to accept it. No, what's, what is really happening is that your offering to God is going to reflect on what you're going to, what you're going to reap. That's what's really going to happen because in, any, in no way, shape, or form are you ever going to hurt God based off of what you're not doing for him. So it's important when we fast that we have a full understanding for, of why we're fasting. We're not fasting just to fast. This is probably the only routine fast I do throughout the whole calendar year is the first fruits fast. All the other fasts come from, okay, I need to fast because this person is about to die, or this person is going to jail, or this is going on, or this person to get saved. There are times when the Holy Spirit will lead me into a fast because of the situation and circumstance, but this is the only probably routine fast I got throughout the entire year, and I'm giving God my first. We talked about first already. So fasting is abstaining from food and water. That's the, that's the basic operation and definition of the word fast, or fasting. When you say you're fasting, most commonly you're, you're, you're abstaining from food and water because that's something that our body needs to survive. So we're abstaining from food and, and drink. First time, or one of the first times we see fasting in the Bible is in Deuteronomy 9, 9 through 18. Let me turn to that real quick. I don't have to talk a whole lot about fasting because we understand what fasting is. It's just doing it and understanding it is two different things. And it's important that we have an understanding when we're doing stuff. And I can say right now, I know a whole lot of people that waste their time fasting because they go into a fast and come out and they, some of them tell them they're worse because you're not doing it with an understanding. The first book I ever authored that's published is, was on fasting. And God gave me revelation and understanding on, on how fasting can be beneficial to the believer when they do it effectively. So Deuteronomy 9, 9 through 18, it says, When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tablets of stone, even the tables of the covenant, which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. So if you've been following me, we talked about it in John, how he says, Abide in me and I will abide in you. So, so Moses went to the mountain to abide to, to, to get into the Lord mano y mano. Why didn't he just give him the tablets of stone when he was with everybody else? No, he separated him away from the group of the people, excuse me, so he could abide with him. So it's important when you fast 
that you try to get away from anything and everything that's common. They will be distractions to you. I know that firsthand. He says again, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 9, when I was gone up into the mount to receive the tab tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant, which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount 40 days and 40 nights, neither did eat nor drink water. Now you say, well, how was he able not to eat, eat or drink for 40 days and 40 nights? Because he was abiding. It's amazing. If you've ever fasted for any length of time without food and water, and you did what God was telling you to do by way of the Spirit, you don't get hungry. I can say that. You do not get hungry for food. Verse 10, And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. 11, And it came to pass at the end of the forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me two tables of stone, even the tables of covenant. Verse 12, And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly, from hence the people which thou has brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten image. They have quickly turned aside from God. And see, that's why it's so important that when you're when you call yourself following the word of the living God, that you understand what the Bible is saying. Because the traditions of men will turn you away from God and make you think you're serving God and you ain't nowhere near him. You know how many, I don't want to run on a list because that's not what I'm here to do today, but you know how many, many man-made traditions are in the assembly or the church or the body of Christ that have nothing to do with God? And that's not even throwing shade in the church, that's just speaking truth. You know how many, this is what I had to do when I first got delivered from traditions of men. I had, to, I had to know what I needed to deliver from. I'm like, hold on, where is that in the Bible? And where is that? So we're in assembly and we're fellowshipping and we're here lifting up the name of Jesus. You can't just make up stuff and tell the people, okay, this is what we're going to do. Why? Why are we doing it? Because the Bible is the basic instructions before leaving earth. We have everything we need right here that we're supposed to be doing, especially in God's house. So these people had decided they was going to make something up. He says, they have quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them molt, a molten image. I can go all day on that. 13. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. So when you talk to people, when I, I minutes to people before, I ain't got to fast, I ain't got to pray, I ain't got, well, the Bible says you do. So when you choose not to do what God has commanded you to do, to, have a, to abide in him, you're a stiff-necked person. I'm not doing that because I don't want to do it. Well, you ain't got to. The choice is yours. But your life is his. And he will he will judge your soul at the end of the life when it's time to go. Based off of what he has commanded and told you to do. And one thing I love doing when I pray for people, in particular when I stand there from, what did God tell you? Uh, No, what did God say to you? What did he tell you? You're up here receiving prayer. You're coming to me for prayer because you know something is not lining up. And you're up here in submission trying to get it right. But what did he tell you? Because if you don't know what God told you, guess who you're listening to? You're either following your, your, your fears or following something that's anti-Christ. At the end of the day, you're following the voice of the enemy, our adversary, the devil. He says, for they are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made a molten image. 13. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. 14. Let me alone, that I may destroy them. This is what God said he's going to do to the people that he delivered. Let me alone, that I may destroy them, and blot out their name. This is a foreshadow of what's going to happen when people in the day of the rapture they stand before God in judgment when your name ain't written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You will be blotted out if you don't do what God has called and created you to do. I don't know how you believe, how you think that it's a choice if you're a believer. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You can't make up your own form of godliness and expect to go to heaven. 
Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make of thee a nation mightier than and greater than they. Verse 15. So I turned and came down out of the mountain. The mount burned with fire. And the two tables of stone were in my hands. In two hands. 16. And I looked and behold you have sinned against the Lord your God. That's who you sin against. Yeah, you may offend your brother, you may transgress against your brother, your sister, your spouse, your, whoever, but you sin against God at the end of the day. James 4, 17, he did not do good and do it not to him, it is a sin. So you sin against God. And I looked and behold, you have sinned against the Lord your God and made a molten calf. You have turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord hath commanded you. You know my problem is with pagan holidays ain't near one of them in the Bible. You can't find not one of these pagan secular holidays that even believers celebrate in the Bible, but yet still believers do them. So what do you think you've done? I'm going to tell you, the Bible just told you. You have made a molten calf. All these little fake holidays that people are celebrating, you literally have created a molten calf and you have erred and got away from the commandments of the Lord. I don't care how anointed, how appointed, how much of a prophet, I don't care how many books you done sold, I don't care how many tongues you speak in, I don't care if you even walk on water, do signs and wonders, because the Bible talks about that those, some will be deceived by that in the end days. If you are not doing what the Bible says, you are not a believer. You ain't. You cannot do stuff in, in the name of a God, when God ain't told you to do it. And December 25th is the worst one. The worst of all of them, because people are doing stuff that ain't nowhere near their Bible. There ain't no way you can squeeze that, that pagan holiday into the Bible. There's no room for it. Because it's mixed worship. It's totally confusing. I was driving on the, on the, on the, on the road, and I saw somebody had a tree up, a big old tree up, and they had the Hanukkah uh, little thing. I said, make up your mind. How are you going to start? You literally letting people know there's two options. Well, let me tell you, with Jesus Christ, there's not two options. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There's no two choices. You're either on Jesus' side or you're on the devil. You ain't no, there ain't no two. Where do, where do people get this stuff from? He said in 16, and I looked and behold, you have sinned against the Lord your God, and have made you a molten calf, you have turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. Still talking about first fruits fast. <laughs> and I looked the two tables and cast them out of my hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as the first forty days and forty nights, and did neither eat, break bread, nor drink water because of all your sins which you have sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And, and you can record me saying it. I believe the reason why this virus was allowed is because we have literally provoked God to anger by disobeying his commandments and making up stuff to do. So, you know, I preached on, when I preached on fasting and all the different fasts in the Bible, and let me say this as we prepare for first we fast and we still got a couple more services where we'll be preparing and talking about it but it's so important that you understand beyond the shadow of any and every doubt what God has called and created you to do us but you in particular because you ain't going to stand in judgment with nobody else you're going to be standing there by yourself so it's important that you know what God has called and created you to do and that's one another reason and I talk, let me say this as a disclaimer there's nowhere in your Bible, excuse me, where you could turn and say first fruit fast and like that. But we are commanded to give God our first. We are commanded to bear fruit and we are commanded to fast. So, you know, you, you can put it together or de 